So it's really, really amazing for me to be here because uh, like many kids, I grew up with some really epic challenges in health and poverty, my family did. Um, my family actually, uh, at one point, they rented a house that was on acres of land. And as part of some type of bartering system, I'm not sure exactly what my young parents were doing, but they, uh, they actually uh, made an arrangement with the landlord that if we were to keep those damn sheep in the corral, that we would get some type of discount on our rent. You guys with me on that? So we would have to periodically go get these sheep. They would get out, and we'd have to bring them back and get them in their pen. And in inevitably what had happened is, uh, of course, it was in the middle of the night, these sheep got out. And so, um, you know, my young parents, they, they went and got their little flock of sheep, and my brother got his, and here I am. I'm about this old, and uh, I got my flashlight, and I'm sitting there running around going, whoo, whoo, come on. And I'm bringing my sheep. I'm pushing them back towards the house to get them back into the pen. And um, not really understanding the proximity. I mean, this was pitch black. I'm, I'm watching them literally vanish in front of my eyes. And I didn't understand the, really the proximity to the danger I was putting them in. I was actually driving them off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, that's how I felt. <laughs> so anyway, the minute you learn like, what you were doing, like panic sets in, right? And so what do you do? You start screaming, stop, stop. And uh, if you ever want to get sheep to stop, don't yell at them first. And then second, don't run after them. So I'm like. Stop, and I'm running after them. They just jump quicker and further to their demise. And so uh, my message, I'm, I'm going to try to bring this around somehow, but is to, uh, you know, I don't want you to be part of the herd. And so uh, if you really find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect at points in your life. And this is one of those. So we're in a state in life, in health, in crisis, where I want you, this, this is not going to be the popular talk of uh, throughout the day. So this is the one that you're going to have a problem with if you're like the majority of people. Um, so I don't want you to be part of the herd. So when I ask people, hey, how are you doing today, the standard condition response is, hey, I'm doing good. And in health, health care, it's very similar. So you can actually kind of do your own pilot study, go home for Thanksgiving and be with your friends and family. And I want you to ask them one question. Hey, how are you doing with your health? Do you know what 9 out of 10 people say to you? I'm doing good. I'm doing great. Um, despite the fact that the average American today takes over 12 to 15 prescriptions per year. And you still say to yourself, well, you know, you just don't understand. I need that or I need this. And that's where we're at today. So what I want to talk to you about is, um, is that the best solution or are we being brainwashed? And so we're kind of being brainwashed in the fact that we think somehow, some way, um, Disease and degeneration is just some type of natural progression of age. Uh, maybe it's a genetic tendency. Or worse yet, we buy into this idea that it's, it's, it's in my family. And so if I, if I lived like that, I would probably had my first heart, uh, heart attack by now. I would have you know, been diagnosed with cancer or something to that effect. So I don't live the way my family lives in that respect. So if we look at the statistics, statistics today in terms of how are we doing, despite what you say, hey, I'm doing good or I'm doing great with my health. Uh, America's not doing so hot if we really look at the, the statistics. We're actually last overall in health in the industrialized world. And the topic today is really the stuff that we can prevent. So the, the lifestyle-related issues and illnesses that we kind of create by ourselves. So degenerative disease. So we do lead many categories, and one of them is degenerative illness. And we create more degenerative illnesses and diseases than any country of the world. We're on top. So that's things like heart disease, diabetes, cancers, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's diseases, the things that we actually kind of do to ourselves that create these problematic conditions. So what can we do as a solution? Uh, well, if we look at our solutions today, if you go into your doctor's visits, routine doctor visits, whether it's with your kids or yourself or a family member, Inside of 15 minutes, what do you have in your hands? You know, so if you have high blood pressure, there's something called the standard of care. It's a protocol that physicians have to take. Is you would reasonably do um, what would be necessary for a patient if they came in with that condition. So the standard of care protocol in this culture today, we make up 5% of the world's population, and we take roughly about 80% of the worldwide medication. So we are highly drugged. 
And if we look at that, we want to ask ourselves, well, how is that working? How is that working for us? I'm not an anti-medicine or anti-drug guy. I, I just, I'm pro-health, and I want you to begin to ask the questions when you're in front of the doctor. So if you go in with the high blood pressure, what's the standard of care protocol? You get a blood pressure lowering medication. You go in there with high cholesterol, what do you get? If you go in with type 2 diabetes, which is the type that's created by your mouth, what you eat, what are they going to do to lower the blood sugar? And so that's inside of a 15 minute conversation. And so what I'm trying to figure out is, well, is that helping us or hurting us? Is it getting us out of the heart disease, the cancers, the diabetes, or is it just kind of you know, masking the symptoms? Meaning if I go into the dentist with a toothache and I have a cavity, it's pain, right? But if they put numbing cream on it and they don't do anything about the cavity, what happens? It gets worse and worse, I lose the tooth, and that's what we're doing with our health. We're treating symptoms and we're not correcting the cause. So I'm about correcting the cause. So how does treating symptoms work for us? Well, I'm reminded of this. You know, if you think back to the pain of the terrorist attacks, I want you to think of, well, what is your greatest threat in health? You know, 9-11, you know, that sparks anger and pain and all these frustrations, and we think about it every year. So if we're going to round some numbers here, about 6,000 deaths in that attack that we revisit every year, you would have to multiply the number of deaths in that attack by about 120 to 130 every single year. And that's how many people die every single year due to iatrogenic death. If you're familiar with that term, it's time to like open the curtains and begin to look into it and don't take my recommendations. I want you to look into the stats on yourself. Iatrogenic death, which is really medically induced or doctor-induced death, side effects to prescription drugs. And it's not wrong diagnosing, it's right diagnosing, and people are dying by the thousands. And so we're looking at about 700 plus thousand people per year, every single year. Who's paying attention to that? I got to put it on your radar. You have to begin looking at it and seeing it for yourself, and I promise you it's going to be astonishing from this day forward. Every three commercials, you're going to see a drug ad, or a medical institution or an organization driving you to the profits. Well, you just don't understand. I need that. It's genetic, this and that. Less than 2 to 5% of every lifestyle illness, less than 2 to 5% of the conditions that we suffer with today are actually a genetic predisposition. But if you had a genetic predisposition, what do you think you should do? like you had a genetic predisposition for heart disease. I'm going to do everything possible to avoid that. But we think the answer and the savior is in, in drugs, in doctors. That's not your answer and that's not your savior. The, the savior is within you. So we have this false confidence and false sense of influence by the people with all the letters behind their names because they got the research and the evidence. It kind of reminds me of the story of the Titanic. So we all know the blockbuster hit, right? The Titanic was touted as like the most luxurious ship of its time. It's the most technologically advanced ship of its era. You know, they didn't even prepare the ship when they went on that maiden voyage there with the number of lifeboats to carry the number of passengers because they had that much confidence in it. And that's our confidence in our healthcare system today, but it's broken. And the th issue is, is that with the, like the Titanic, you know, as I was thinking about this story, bringing it to you today, is this. It wasn't like, so they see the iceberg ahead of them, and I'm trying to put the iceberg in front of you. It wasn't like they just smacked into the iceberg. You know, as you kind of read the story and look into it a little bit further, they tried to course correct. So they knew it was coming. They tried to course correct. And what had happened is they just kind of scraped along the side of the hull, and it was just nothing but small cracks in small fissures. So what takes you and your family down? What's going to affect you and your health and your future and the next generation? It's not the trauma. It's not that, you know, so yes, there's car accidents and these types of things, but that's not what is getting us today. We're last over on health. We create more degenerative disease and illnesses than ever before in history. In fact, this is the first generation 
their life expectancy is not supposed to be as long as their parents. In addition to the first generation, where it used to be when you didn't have money or you were impoverished, which meant you had lack of access to health care, you were your life expectancy was lower. You guys all with me on that? Like if you didn't have the access, you didn't live as long. Well, now the direct opposite is actually happening. The people that have the money and have the dollars and have the access, more doctor visits, more routine checkups, more drugs, they're dying earlier. Think Michael Jackson. Everything at his fingertips dies early. So the thing is, is when we look at the Titanic, we think, you know, these people, there was a, there was a part in the movie where the guy's literally playing the violin, right? They didn't pay attention to the alarms. Well, don't listen to this crazy chiropractor right here. You know, listen to the neurologists and the MDs and the pediatricians, the oncologists, the people that are making movies and writing books and documentaries saying, hey, stop. 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 But we're in that medical treadmill. We believe that that pill, potion, or lotion is, is it. And we don't have, we're not taking the responsibility over our health the way that we should. We're actually giving it to the doctors, that they're responsible for our health. And if I do get into a problem, then that pill, potion, lotion, drug, or surgery is going to fix it. Understand that's not working, and that's not how it works. So what is a solution that we can gravitate towards? What can we do today moving forward that can change the trajectory of this? Because if you do what most Americans do for your health and your conditions, you end up like most Americans, and it's not working. And so what can you do? The, pro the issue is the complexity of your conditions has nothing to do with the simplicity of the solutions. And if we can think the evidence and research is this. Can we create disease by the things we put in our body, the things we smoke, drink, put on our skins? Can we create disease? Example, if I smoke cigarettes, can I create lung cancer? Yes or yes? We can. So we know the things that we ingest can create illness and disease. So we can eat our way into type, type, type 2 diabetes. Can we eat our way out of it? You guys with me? So the issue is, is how come they're not teaching those things? As simple as it is to change the course, we're going to course correct. And we got we to gotta preserve yourself from, from the small cracks and small fissures. So the things that you can do today is simple. It's so simple, you don't even do it, which is you can simply eat real foods. What is real food? Real food isn't pizza, although I love pizza. Real food isn't. Uh, you know, potato chips, it's the potato, right? So real food, when I look at real food, and as, I, as often as I get asked questions, you know, I'm in the weight loss injury, industry, health industry, all these things, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? You don't understand, I have this. I first start with their diet diary, and then I start with, okay, what's going in their body to create their conditions? Because I want to correct the cause, not just treat symptoms. What can you do? You can simply eat real foods. And the further anything gets away from its normal natural state, the more potentially dangerous and life-threatening it is to your body. And yeah, I said that. So real food is living at one time. So an apple on a tree is living. It's got live enzymes in there. It's great for your body and so forth. Um, so it may have you know, walked a, a, around in the woods. It may have swam in the stream. That's real food. It's the things. Our bodies were designed to eat, made to eat, for us to create the building blocks to health. So if you want real health, not drugs and surgery and routine checkups, you want to save on the premiums and the doctor visits and doctor costs, you want real health, you got to get the real building blocks to that, which begins with the things you put in your body. So if you don't want real health, you think you're going to get away with it, like my dad who dies at 55, he says, you know, something to the effect of, hey, if it's going to affect my quality of life, if I'm in a wheelchair, um, you know, if, I, if I'm staring off into a ceiling or pissing my pants, I'd rather you just get rid of me. I don't want to change my lifestyle. But the issue is, is it's so simple, and it has such a dramatic impact. And if we look at 
what are the things that what are the things that you want to avoid? Is it commercialized? Is it processed? Has it been industrialized? Walk away from that. So those commercialized products, those are the things with all the chemicals, the dyes, the toxins, the things that uh, it's, it's just laden with things that create toxicity in you. It numbs your, your sensations. It gets you addicted. And you are being targeted every single day by multi-million dollar companies to get you addicted to that stuff. Real food kind of resets all of that. It gives you your taste sensations back. It gives you your health back. It gives you the opportunity to avoid all the unwanted things that people are suffering with. So a couple things we can do to change the trajectory and course correct. You know, if you find yourself with that doctor, I believe this. I believe we can change you know, the trajectory in the next decade. And if you have a doctor, whether it's high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, whatever it is, and they want to hand you a pill within 15 minutes, I believe what we need to do is we need to change the standard of care. So creating a rule or a law or a requirement that before they put that in your hand, they have to have the 5, 10, 15 minute conversation and dialogue about the foods that are creating your type 2 diabetes. Not only creating it, but how do you get yourself out of it? And if they can't do that, find somebody that can. Walk away. It's a prescription for a disaster because just like the numbing cream, it doesn't fix anything. You got to begin to correct the cause. So simply eat real foods. Why do we want to begin to look into this in the first place? Why should I pay attention to this? Is this something, is he just throwing numbers up there? Or is this the real deal? People are sick, suffering, and dying every day, and I see it. And my colleagues see it as well, and we're trying to change that. Why do you want to do it for yourself and your family? Um, I call it the, the why power versus the willpower. Why you want to do it? Um, maybe for yourself. You're sick of suffering in your body. You're sick of the drugs. You're sick of being sick. You know, I want to be fulfilling lots of things in my life. And to do that, I want to be you know, doing push-ups when I'm 70. I don't want to be pushing a walker. Uh, you want to do it for your family. You, you want to make better choices and decisions, not for yourself. I wish my father would have made decisions because, Dad, I wish you were here. You know, maybe you didn't want to do it for you, but damn it, I wish you would have done it for me or my sister. You want to do it for your purpose. You all have a calling. That's why you're here. And you're, you're listening to that calling, and you're paying attention to it. I want to fulfill a purpose, which is to transform and impact people's lives. And you know what? I do it for God. It's going to be a pretty miserable day if I'm not allowed to bring God at the center of all of this. And when people ask me to cut that out of a workshop or a talk, don't invite me back. Because I will always do the things I do for my core four. Self, family, purpose, and God. And so the thing that I want you to take away is the complexity of your condition has nothing to do with the simplicity of your solution. And you can start by just simply eating real foods. I love you. Bless you. Have a good night.